Okay, thanks everybody for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Joshua Tucker. I'm the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at NYU. And it is my great pleasure to welcome everybody here today on behalf of the Jordan Center uh, at NYU, as well as the Harriman Institute at Columbia. Uh, I'm joined by my uh, co-partner in all of these, uh, Alex Cooley from the Harriman Institute at Columbia. And we're very grateful to the support of the Carnegie Corporation of New York, which has been uh, supporting this uh, series uh, since we got started. This is part of what we call the New York City Russia Public Policy Series. It is a joint endeavor of Harriman and the Jordan Center, along with the support of Carnegie, uh, in which we try to uh, tackle pressing public policy issues related to Russia that are taking place in the world. We often bring together uh, academics and practitioners as well. Uh, we've been meeting since the pandemic about once a month with a, with a break in the summer. Uh, you can find upcoming events schedules at both the Harriman Institute as well as the Jordan Center. We've been at this for many years now. We were doing this uh, offline before we did it online. Our next event will be in February uh, and is going to focus on environmentalist movements in Russia. Uh, but today we are gathered here for an all too, uh, unfortunately, all too uh, current event uh, that is going to take place on crisis and bargaining over Ukraine, a new U.S.-Russia security order. So thanks to all of you for joining us here today. I'm going to turn it over to Alex, who is going to introduce our, our speakers and tell you all a little bit about the format of how we are going to proceed here today. Alex? Josh, thanks so much. And welcome to you all to our first RPP of 2022. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel, but a lot of great perspectives and we have five speakers. So we're gonna ask speakers to go for about eight minutes, uh, but no more than 10. In order to save time, I'm just gonna give very brief introduction of our speakers um, um, right before uh, they speak in, uh, in in their order and we will post more information about who they are and their bios as well as any recent relevant writings and they all have recent relevant writings part of the reason we invited them uh, on the panel on the chat here's the thing if you have a question please use the q a tab to write your question um, try and keep it to one or two questions right we're not going to answer six of your questions um, and if you have it directed at someone, please mention that in your question too. I'd like to ask Keith about this or Mary about this or Olya about this. Um, let us know. We will do our best to get to all of them, but we of course can't guarantee it um, given the size of the audience. So without uh, further ado, let me just say uh, uh, a couple of things. The title of this panel uh, reflects uh, the, the, this piece that we're looking at today, there's different perspectives you could take on today. There's a lot of panels going on, um, but we wanted to offer context on this notion of this time as an inflection point politically um, in, in, in where we are. And so uh, our kind of uh, kickoff speaker here uh, is uh, Mary Surratt, who is uh, the Kravis Professor of Historical Studies at Johns Hopkins University, also a researcher at Harvard Center for European Studies. And uh, her books include uh, uh, Not One Inch, America, Russia, and the Making of a Post-Cold War uh, Stalemate that was named a Foreign Affairs Best Book of 2021. Um, it is a fabulous work. And we thought uh, uh, Mary can provide an overview, a little bit of how we got to this point, particularly because we've read a lot about uh, NATO enlargement, what was and wasn't promised, um, and really uh, uh, NATO enlargement in this moment as a crisis inflection point in the post-Cold War uh, order. So uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Excellent, honored to be here in this company, even if the uh, reason we're here is a very distressing one. Yeah, in the brief time I have, I, I just want to make uh, three, uh, three quick points. Um, by way of introduction, I've been having a slightly surreal past month because, as you know, at a press conference on December 23rd, 2021, Vladimir Putin started saying, not one inch, not one inch. We were promised not one inch. And this led um, various people to tweet at me product placement alert. And um, how did you hire Putin as a publicist? So it's been for a, you know, a historian, someone who works in historical documents, kind of surreal to see Putin basically holding Ukraine hostage to refight these historical battles that I've been studying. So as I said, three points briefly, and then I'm happy to get into the weeds in questions if people want. So first, 
uh, of course, there is the 1990 not one inch debate. Uh, that's the phrase that I chose for the title of my book. That's uh, Putin's assertion that the US Secretary of State, James Baker, uh, told the last Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, that NATO would move not one inch eastward. I uh, chose to use that actually as the title of my book because I realized that title had a bigger connotation. My book actually looks at uh, the entire period between the end of the Cold War and the start of COVID in depth with a focus on the 1990s. And I realized that over the course of the 1990s, that phrase, <clears throat> not one inch, took on the exact opposite meaning. After the Soviet Union collapsed, Washington realized it could not only win big, it could win bigger, and not one inch of Europe needed to be off limits to NATO. And the end result of that is the open door policy, which so aggravates Moscow now. But the key phrase, not one inch, actually comes from a conversation between Secretary of State James Baker and Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. And both of them have subsequently muddied the waters. Uh, in the fine tradition of Winston Churchill, Churchill, who said, history will be kind to me because I plan to write it, uh, both of them have subsequently offered narratives of these events that don't match with the historical record. So uh, James Baker uh, has um, tried to dismiss this. And one of the surprises for me when I was researching in Baker's private papers was an anguished note from his ghostwriter, a longtime script writer, uh, sorry, a, a speech writer for Baker and a longtime admirer of his who had worked with Baker at the State Department and then come over to be part of the ghostwriting team for his memoirs. He wrote a note to Baker saying, you know, if you just keep changing all these, his, you know, quotes and events, especially from 1990, 1991, your book is just going to be dismissed as spin. And the this uh, ghostwriter even went so far as to say, this is what your New York Times book review is going to read, like Mr. Secretary. It's going to say James Baker is doing now what he did in the past so well, spinning history to his own benefit. And uh, Baker ignored that plea from his ghostwriter. And sure enough, the New York Times review said almost exactly that. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev has actually taken part in some of the same practices. So Mikhail Gorbachev famously said in 1990, the issue of NATO expansion never came up. And that quotation has received wide circulation. It was actually on the front page of the New York Times just a couple of weeks ago. The problem is if you read the rest of the quotation, uh, it starts to uh, be quite hair raising. If you keep going in the quotation, Gorbachev starts referring to himself in the third person and trying to bully the journalist to whom he was giving the interview into portraying him in a favorable light. So again, this is Gorbachev speaking of himself in the third person. He said, don't portray Gorbachev as a naive person. He wasn't naive. NATO expansion did not come up. It didn't come up in 1991. It didn't even come up after the Warsaw Pact existed. It never came up. Don't portray Gorbachev as a naive person. If there were any naive Russian leaders, it was the later ones. So uh, when I, as a historian, look at this, I try to go back to the original evidence from the time. And it became apparent to me that Gorbachev 2014 contradicted Gorbachev 1990, because in Gorbachev's own notes, which match with Baker's own notes from the actual event, both of them clearly talked about NATO moving not one inch eastward. And it was also clearly a speculative conversation. In other words, it uh, was phrased roughly as follows. Baker said uh, something like, hey, Mikhail Gorbachev, again, I'm paraphrasing the exact quotations are in the book. How about you let your half of Germany go so it can unify? and we move NATO not one inch eastward, question mark. In other words, this was taking place in the context of German unification. The Berlin Wall had come down and the Germans wanted to unify, but because of the unconditional surrender of Nazi Germany in 1945, the Soviet Union still had 380,000 troops in East Germany and uncontested legal rights over all of Germany. So in order for Germany to unify, Moscow had to be convinced to give up both its legal rights and its troops. And so Baker was talking in a speculative way, how about this is the deal? We say NATO moves not one inch eastward and, and then you give up your part of Germany. And Gorbachev said, well, yes, we should talk about that. Certainly NATO shouldn't move eastward, but there's nothing formalized. So it certainly comes up contrary to what Gorbachev later says, uh, contrary to um, some of Baker's later remarks, although he's a little uneven. The problem for the Russian uh, view today, Vladimir Putin's view today that they were betrayed, is that when that long process of negotiation over Juma and unification came to an end, what was actually put down on paper at the end 
uh, the, the document that Moscow signed actually codified the opposite. In other words, the final settlement on German unification from September 1990 explicitly allows NATO to begin extending Article 5 eastward across the Cold War front line into Eastern Germany. Article 5 and NATO can cross the Cold War front line and Moscow signed that treaty. So even though there had been the speculative talk, what Moscow actually signed and Gorbachev authorized the signature was actually the opposite. And even more important, Gorbachev did so knowing by then that NATO uh, was now in play, not just for Eastern Germany, but also for Central and Eastern Europe. Again, from his own notes from the time, not to mention multiple other sources, Gorbachev in 1990 made a note. He said, I told Baker, we are aware of the interest of the Central and Eastern European countries to leave the Warsaw Pact in order to join NATO later. This is by the spring of 1990. So Gorbachev, it certainly comes up. He's aware that it's also taking place in the broader context of Central and Eastern Europe. But in the end, he has other priorities. He needs cash. His country is falling apart and he agrees to let Germany unify for financial incentives. So that's the narrative of events. But of course, that's different than the emotional weight and the way that Putin is instrumentalizing it. So Putin, has been omitting any mention of the final settlement of Germany, what Moscow actually signed. And instead, he's been playing up this speculative conversation from 1990 saying we were betrayed. So that's the 1995. That's the first or three points I wanted to make. The other two will be briefer. The second fight is now about 1997, which is emerging as another major controversy in its own right in part because Putin on December 17th, 2021, had the Russian foreign ministry issue a draft treaty for NATO, as well as a draft treaty for the United States, saying that NATO needs to roll its forces back to where they were on May 27th, 1997. To repeat, May 27th, 1997. Why that date? Well, as this is a Russia savvy audience, your audience knows that's when the NATO-Russia Founding Act was signed, there's a controversy about that as well. Boris Yeltsin, who became the Russian president, obviously, after the Soviet Union collapsed, Boris Yeltsin had a big fight with Clinton over the meaning of that final settlement of Germany for the rest of Europe. This is uh, one of the few things that Washington and Moscow agreed on. They both agreed that the 1990 settlement was only about Germany. What they disagreed was what that meant. The Western side felt that the treaty only dealt with Germany and said nothing about Central and Eastern Europe. There's nothing about any other country in the language. And so it had no impact on NATO going to further countries, farther countries, Central and Eastern Europe. Yeltsin, in contrast, felt that that treaty only allowed Article 5 to extend into Eastern Germany and not beyond. And it should have prohibited any more expansion eastward and Moscow should have a veto. And so in a sense, the 1997 NATO-Russia Founding Act negotiations were kind of a rematch, and Yeltsin kept trying to get a veto over NATO expansion. In the end, he did not get it. There is no veto in the NATO-Russia Founding Act. Uh, that's not, it's not even a legally binding document. It's not a treaty like the final settlement on Germany. But here's where it gets complicated. Yeltsin, to fend off domestic critics, just started saying that he'd gotten a veto anyway. So he just started saying on camera and in public, I got a veto over NATO expansion. Behind the scenes, Americans con uh, contacted Russian diplomats and said, you know, this is not right. And they wrote back and said, yes, we know, but we can't stop Yeltsin from saying this. And, and he's drunk half the time anyway. So there was this public perception created that uh, Russia had gotten a veto over NATO expansion, which was yet another betrayal. So that leads to the third and final point that, that today Putin is instrumentalizing this history uh, using these, these controversies, this lack of clarity, this discrepancy between what participants said in public and what was actually written down to generate this sense of betrayal. And he's in essence holding Ukraine hostage to force a do-over of these battles because he thinks he can do better than Gorbachev and Yeltsin. He wants it in writing this time, by God, which is why he's circulating these draft treaties and wants things in writing. And there is a fundamental problem here. Um, obviously, what Putin is doing to Ukraine is, is deeply immoral. I am on record of, as having described Putin as the leader of a grim and murderous regime. So there is no doubt about the, um, 
uh, the uh, horrible nature of what he is actually doing to Ukraine. There is, however, a broader issue, which is that the current European security system does not have a birth in it for the biggest country in Europe, i.e. Russia. In other words, Russia is obviously a major country. It is too nuclear to ignore. Uh, more than 30 years after the end of the Cold War, the US and Russia still between themselves control 90% of the world's nuclear warheads and are still the only two countries that could end most life on earth in minutes. And yet Russia does not have a, a birth or a stake in the European security order as this massive country with this massive army. And Putin has realized that's a not an, a, an unsustainable situation. And he's decided to push matters by holding Ukraine hostage and to whip up uh, anti-NATO sentiment by playing on these historical controversies. So those are the three main points, the 1990 controversy, the 1997 controversy, and the way Putin is instrumentalizing it now. And that's kind of the historical background to what's happening on the ground. As I said, happy to go into the weeds on any of those and questions if people want. All right, thanks so much for that. Our next speaker is Maxim Shuchkov, who is the director of the Institute for International Studies and associate professor at the Department of Applied International Analysis at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, MGMO, um, by its shorter uh, acronym. He is also an expert at RIEC, uh, the Russian International Affairs Council, and a member of the Valdai Discussion Club, also a very prolific commentator uh, who has been writing on this topic more and more in some of the, the US-Russian um, bilateral negotiations and of course the presidential summit um, earlier in the year. Uh, Max, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we'll go over to you for your perspective on the current moment we're in. Thank you so much, Alex, and thanks everyone for, uh, for to Columbia and NYU for, for having me for, to participate in this discussion. I think it's incredibly important to have uh, a couple of slides to share here. Uh, and again, as, as uh, Mary pointed out, this is a, a Russia savvy audience, so I won't uh, go into details in my presentation, but would happy to take any questions if, if, if any emerge uh, in the Q&A. Uh, a little bit of context. I think uh, there are four important elements here for us to consider. One is this is a third attempt at a major deal in the post World War II uh, history. Uh, I think uh, you know the the a recent article uh, of my former academic advisor Angela Stan of Georgetown University that appeared in the Foreign Affairs suggested uh, the same. It, it said it's a, it's a Yalta number one. The end of the Cold War was the second attempt, and now is a third attempt. I would just add a little note that I don't think it's it's another. Uh, stab at Yalta, because Yalta ultimately was a negotiation and an agreement between the winners. Uh, what Russia is trying to do is to renegotiate, quote unquote, uh, the unfavorable terms that Putin thinks uh, that Moscow was faced with or was, or was forced to uh, embrace in late 1980s, 1990s. And now this is kind of a third uh, attempt to renegotiate this. There is also a third attempt to compel US to these talks. I think Putin's uh, speech in Munich uh, in 2007 ended uh, the era of U.S.-Russia relations of 1990s, uh, and at the time, basically, the the, the pathos of, of Putin's speech was that the unilateral U.S. dominant world is unacceptable and it's fraught with all kinds of dangerous and security risks. Any speech instead was seen as Russia's own, uh, you know, signal for Russia's own revanche, revanchist ambitions. It wasn't taken seriously, and a little over a year after the war in South Ossetia happened, uh, and you know Russia recognized independence of Abkhazia and uh, North Ossetia, and it blamed the crisis uh, not just on Saakashvili. Saakashvili was seen as a, as a tool in that conflict, but largely on the West for kind of endorsing or not taking this Russian concern seriously. The second attempt uh, that Putin uh, was tried to negotiate was in the post-Arab uh, spring environment, sort of uh, in a way paddled by the Volotnaya protests in Moscow that Russia also saw as an interference in its own domestic affairs because of the Hillary Clinton, uh, then State Secretary, comment to, to support the protesters. Uh, but also because of the Libya intervention of NATO and other things, so there was this uh, second attempt to ne negotiate the quote unquote security guarantees for Russia that didn't happen. And uh, almost two years after that, we, we got the crisis in Ukraine and takeover of Crimea. Uh, 
Uh, so this is in Putin's view, I, I, I think, is a third attempt, serious attempt to compel the U.S. to talks. Uh, and that's a big question why now is the moment. But there is also, I think, an element in Russia's grandier kind of diplomatic offenses to put to the test uh, which of the three narratives on U.S. policy in Europe that were popular or shaped up in, in Moscow uh, over the course of 30 years since the breakup of the Soviet Union were true. One narrative is kind of, uh, you know, is in a, this big Brzezinski kind of framework uh, that you need to contain uh, Russia, you know, geo geopolitically uh, deter, contain, compel. Uh, and that's the reason, you know, you need Ukraine in, in NATO and um, that kind of, that school of thought, very popular in, in, in Moscow, as you, you may, uh, you know. The second narrative is pretty much uh, it says that, well, because U.S. does not really see Russia as a peer power uh, in any domain except perhaps the strategic stability, it just was acting by inertia in, in Europe uh, after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. I didn't take any complaints that were coming from Moscow any seriously. So it's just, you know, uh, nothing personal, just business. And the third narrative is that the U.S. really didn't care all that much for geopolitics in Europe in, uh, after, after the end of the Cold War and was busy with other things, you know, globalization, other regions, Middle East, so on and so forth. So it allowed uh, the countries that have traditionally difficult relations with Russia, such as Poland, you know, the Baltics, uh, to hijack uh, NATO and Western policy towards Russia uh, and that's why it became very, you know, hostile to Russian interests. So basically, by doing all this diplomatic offensive that Russia is now embarked on, uh, it's it's a it's a way to see, you know, what really is what really drives U.S. US policy in Europe. And also, you know, it, 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 we're coming to this where Moscow uh, proposed these three uh, proposals. I mean, there were more than that, but they roughly could be grouped into three major baskets. One says that NATO military infrastructure should roll back to 1997. Oh, sorry, Max, to interrupt. Um, would you like to put the uh, the show in presentation mode for the pre for, for the proposals that are there? Because we your, your PowerPoint I, just has the, the title slide on it here. Like, and we, wait, and we don't is it, can you see? Can you see, though? I, it says security proposals and then Russia three things and U.S. three things. Yeah, you no. actually need to put it in presentation mode. Oh, I there we go. I, yeah. I, I, Oh, I see. Sorry about that. Yeah, no uh, worries. Thank you. Yeah, that was the third. I, I thought. I thought. You, I thought this. Uh, yeah, now we're good. Thanks. All right. So this is the first things I, I, I spoke about. Now the, the the security proposals, as I said, could be grouped into three major baskets. One, uh, Mary spoke about that. You know, uh, NATO military infrastructure back to nineteen ninety seven. Second, no NATO for Ukraine, uh, but also perhaps by, by default to Georgia, Moldova, Belarus, other post-Soviet states, and no offensive uh, missile systems near Russia. So basically the U.S. response that Secretary Blinken uh, spoke about and then U.S. Ambassador to uh, Moscow, John Sullivan, a pass to MFA, uh, basically responded to all of these three uh, major baskets by two no's and one yes. No, meaning, uh, you know, basically, if you you want NATO military infrastructure rolled back to, to uh, mid-1997, Russia also has to roll back its own, uh, you know, military incursions of the last few years in Crimea and Donbass. Also, no hacking attacks and use of chemical weapons, meaning, you know, the, the uh, attempt uh, to, to kill in, in Salisbury, the uh, Skripal family. Uh, no, uh, meaning to know uh, Ukraine and others will decide, get to decide themselves. And yes, but we're ready to discuss arms control and transparency. Now, uh, what, what we perhaps are now anticipating another meeting between Lavrov and Blinken this year, uh, this week, <laughs> hopefully this year too, but uh, hopefully earlier than that this week. Um, the question, of course, I have no idea on how MFA is going to react, if, if anything, uh, to this uh, kind of th the, the, the first no. The second no, I, I can see uh, how it's going to be framed now uh, in the press uh, conference that Lavrov gave a few days ago was clear that uh, Russia would further tackle uh, the uh, American argument that uh, you know any sovereign nation will have to decide the, for themselves in the framework of the uh, Istanbul Declaration of 1999 in Astana Declaration of 20. 10, uh, that was also promoting this concept of quote unquote indivisible security. Uh, so Larov made it clear that you can't uh, say that every sovereign nation will have to decide on its own alliances uh, 
uh, without separation of this concept that you know no security for one state can be achieved uh, at the expense of the security of the other. So I think that's the next uh, position of, of the Russian uh, diplomacy on this particular issue. Uh, and the, the yes thing, the arms control and transparency, it's important, uh, well, we'll see. Uh, we still haven't heard from the single most important uh, man in this uh, negotiation, President Putin, who whether this response would be enough or whether he would consider other moves. Uh, my guess is he would not consider it as enough and will continue on the military escalation. So I, uh, I'll get back to this idea of a symmetry of threats from democracy and autocracies at the end of my presentation. I'll just say that the military deployment, in my view, and I, 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 and I would think uh, there's a rather consensual view on this in, in, in Moscow and Russian policymaking, with a few exceptions. Uh, that it's not about to to invade into Ukraine, but rather a to deter Ukrainian leadership from further offensives on Donbass and to compel U.S. NATO to further talks. I think Alexander Banov of the Carnegie Moscow Center had an interesting analogy in his latest publication, where he said that the Russian deployment on the, uh, alongside the Ukraine border uh, very, looked very much like the Italian job movie, where the entire city knows that Mario is going to rob the bank. You know everyone beats farewell except for the bank doesn't really think it's going to happen so i think that's an allusion to the recent spats between zelensky and biden uh, whether this you know russian invasion threat should be taken seriously or it's uh fomenting uh uh panic moods uh yeah max now, I, 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 I know i ran out of time yeah thank you i know I'll just quickly wrap up and say for now, even if Russia does not get uh, everything that was uh, asking for, uh, there are some costs and benefits uh, for now. Uh, the costs, I think, obviously, that now Russia got more military presence on the Russian border. If it wanted to, to, to see less now, it has more and more arms to Ukraine. So in some regret, uh, respect, you know, it's uh, U.S. got security guarantees to Ukraine, not, not Russia. Uh, more anti-Russian sentiments inside the, the West, so to say, and possible sanctions. On the uh, benefits side, I would say that now the U.S. Uh, was uh, is now discussing issues that it has previously declined to discuss for for many years. Uh, now the internal different internal fights fomented within NATO, which also plays Russia card. Uh, policy distraction for other regions for the Biden administration and perceptions in the rest of the world are interesting, but uh, for now the assessment is that outside the West, uh, Russian profile has actually risen uh, as a country that you know challenges the U.S. Uh, dominant or openly, and we're still not clear you know whether it, China is really extracting any benefits of this at least in the public uh, perspective or not. I'll end here and we'll perhaps get more to that. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Max. So moving um, to our next speaker, um, who is uh, coming back uh, to another RPP, uh, uh, Olya Onak, who is associate professor, a senior lecturer in politics at the University of Manchester, and has previously held posts at the University of Toronto and University uh, of Oxford, who is always doing interesting field work on domestic protests and domestic political attitudes and public opinions. Um, and Olga, thanks so much for uh, 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 joining us today and, and sharing some of the Ukrainian perspective on what is happening uh, over this uh, post-Cold War settlement and these ordering issues. Thank you so much. So uh, in order, I'm just gonna show you a few slides because it wouldn't be a presentation by Olga if I didn't, I think. Um, some of these slides you might have seen before, um, some of the information here, but I think it's worth putting into context what we know about Ukraine today before I get there. So my job was really to talk about some polling data. I was hoping that the third wave of our mobilized project survey would come in miraculously at the last minute before this presentation, which would have been super cool, but alas, it has not. So the first thing I wanna say, let's talk about what you what is different about the situation today and the situation back in 2014. Well, Ukraine was a mess in 2014. When the annexation of Crimea started, there was no legitimate, well, my colleagues might argue, but really the government in power was not seen as legitimate for the majority of the population. There wasn't a unity around the government in power at the time in March, yeah? You had a power vacuum. You had leaders that were, 
really inexperienced with this sort of elite level negotiations. And they were pushed to the side by Western uh, allies, right? We, we know that uh, Obama administration encouraged Ukrainian politicians to, you know, keep calm, keep your population calm and, and don't do anything. Certainly don't uh, interact with those green men in Crimea. And really no one knew it to make sense of how to make sense of the situation, sadly, for uh, to the demise of, of, of Ukraine's territory of Ukraine and its people. So then what happens between 2014 and 2021 or why Putin might have thought that this is a good time to move on Ukraine again? So loads of data that I'm going to be sharing with you here. But two things. We know that there is a readiness to protest in Ukraine like we haven't seen in years. 55% of the population in 2021 told us that they were ready to protest should the situation arise, signaling large uh, high levels of discontent and qualms amongst the Ukrainian population about the quality of democracy it, it, they were experiencing. Moreover, the percent of the population that thought that protest was the only way to change the government, uh, uh, the course of the government, was at 52%, almost exactly at the level it was in 2014, directly following a mass mobilization. So again, we see that the Ukrainian population is, seems to not be happy with the state of affairs in Ukraine. We also know that uh, Zelensky's approval went down, right? So, and a lot of people have made a lot to, uh, you know, there has been said, there's been a great deal said about this. I actually think that people are overplaying how much Zelensky's approval has declined, considering he has uh, been in power for uh, just a short while uh, during a pandemic. And his approval rating is actually much higher or at the same level as all of his predecessors. So I think Putin might have been interpreting it like much of our colleagues are. Zelensky's approval rating is crashing. Might be a good time to go in. And of course, another indicator of, of discontent in Ukraine is migration intention increased. In, back in 2014, when we asked this question, only 3.6% of the Ukrainian population wanted to leave the country. By spring 2021, 38% of the population want to leave the country. Okay, so yet again, finally, the COVID pandemic, 30%. And I find, I find this number really hard to take because we've had personal deaths in our family because of COVID. 30% of the population in Ukraine know someone who has died from COVID. Meaning that of course, people are very aware that the government is playing down the context uh, in the country uh, when it comes to the pandemic. So you can see why taking all these numbers into account, Putin might think the population is ripe for potential, you know, they're discontented. They possibly are, are divided again. Zelensky's losing his legitimacy. This is a time to go in. Well, the thing that seems to be missing for so many analysts is that the Ukraine of today is not the Ukraine of 2014 on three very important things. One, at the elite level. This is actually a legitimate government. No Ukrainian, well, there are, there are actually seven or so percent that don't find the government. 87% of the population continue to find. Uh, the data here is from 2020, but we have the data also from 2021, the exact same number. Uh, People view this, this is as a highly legitimate president. The leaders, including Zelensky himself, are also established within Ukraine, have better contacts with foreign leaders, um, and they have the ability to coordinate both internally very well and, as we have seen, externally with their allies. Second, Ukrainians have an extremely strong sense of civic identity and civic unity that we've seen only grow over the eight years of conflict. This has become entrenched. This is not about ethnicity or language practice. This is and allegiance to the state above all, which could be a nationalist sentiment, could be misused by populists, but nonetheless, there is that strong element here. And third and foremost, okay, this is unfortunately a little bit blurry. We have a population 
where for the first time ever, 55%, most recently polls show up to 59%, but they're not my polls, so I'm not going to talk about them. 55% of the population support entry into NATO. So Henry Hale, Tim Colton, and I, in various different projects, have been asking this question since 2014 in the exact same way that we ask it. Do you agree or disagree that Ukraine should no join NATO? So this is a little bit better in our, in our view than a referendum question. In 2014, that number did not go beyond 40. In fact, it hovered around 35% throughout the majority of the escalation of the conflict. This number hovered around 40 to 45% throughout the period until 2020. Then about in 2020, we see a first jump in, in the support. And by 2021, we see that uh, for the first time ever, as I say, a majority of the population support this policy. And before someone tries to say, oh, but not in the east of Ukraine, <laughs> Ola, right? Those Easterners and Southerners and Donetsk, and Odessa do not support. Well, you guys are wrong because although they do not support it at the same level as those individuals in the West, their support has grown the most among all Ukrainians since 2019 to 2021. And the data point I'm using here is from February 2021. This is not a result of the escalation and tension. This is a result of something else. Just to be clear here, in the south of Ukraine, from 2019 to 2021, February 2021, the numbers doubled from 15% of Southerners to 31% of Southerners viewing that Ukraine should jo join NATO. In the east of the country, the numbers also doubled, going from 20% of Easterners uh, in 2019, believing that Ukraine should join NATO, going to 40% in February 2021. This number is increasing the more that, escal that tensions escalate throughout 2021. But why? Why has this, why have we seen this jump? Is this just a reaction to Putin and uh, Russian aggression? Perhaps that is one element to the story. But I think a much more important element to the story is the so-called Zelensky effect that seems to be coming up repeatedly as a significant factor in all of our analyses. When I run regression analyses on the panel component of the data from 2019 and 2021, therefore the people that were re-interviewed at these two different points in time, the two top predictors of someone having moved from being an undecided or not a supporter of the policy to join NATO to becoming a supporter of the policy to join NATO. Two factors alone, being in the east and south of the country and having voted for Sluha Narodo or Zelensky. People are missing this element that Zelensky mirrors those southeastern Russophone Ukrainians that for a long time perhaps did not have a political leader that articulated a pro-Euro-Atlantic, pro-NATO sentiment. And this is what's happening in the ground today. And this is why it probably is not, it never is, but Putin's completely miscalculated and a lot of his actions are backfiring, not having the result he would expect among certain populations in, in, in Ukraine. And quite frankly, making Ukrainians only more uh, demanding of this idea of NATO aspiration. This is a problem. This is a problem for the West. They're in private room conversations. Uh, some of us have been privy to those. Western allies have said, you know, the only reason we can't really talk about, the only reason we really can't have that on the table discussion of Ukraine becoming a member of NATO is because the population isn't with you to the elites, right? That, that, that's, those conversations have happened repeatedly. The population is now with the elites and they share this NATO aspiration. The question is, are, is NATO, are your Atlantic uh, allies of Ukraine actually willing to step up to the plate on this? Some of my other colleagues here on the conversation probably have strong views on that. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And, and thanks very much indeed for uh, giving us a sense of what's happened in between the two, the two um, crises.
Uh, our next speaker is Keith Darden, who is an associate professor in the School of International Service at American uh, University. He specializes in comparative politics, international relations, and the international politics of Eurasia. He researches nationalism, state building, the politics of Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. His forthcoming book is called Resisting Occupation from Cambridge University uh, Press. Uh, Keith, thanks so much for joining us again and for sharing your insights and expertise. Oh, and you're on mute, yeah. I, I just realized that, yeah. So thanks for, thanks for uh, inviting me. I think we're here not because um, Russia contests what happened uh, uh, diplomatically in exchanges between uh, Bush and Gorbachev, uh, or that they've made a whole range of new diplomatic proposals. We're here because uh, they've mobilized their military on Ukraine's frontiers. Uh, and I think we should think about uh, the, that process as somewhat related to the ongoing diplomatic process. But I think they might actually be more usefully analytically separated. I think that diplomatic process may be um, a way of stating goals and intentions. Uh, but I don't think that uh, anyone on the Russian side thinks that diplomatic process is going to bear fruit. And that's partly why we're seeing the military mobilization now. So what is the political goal? Anytime you see military intervention or the prospect of military intervention, anybody who's read Clausewitz asks, what is the political goal? In other words, what is this use of force potentially designed to achieve? And I think the broader political goal was articulated to some extent uh, in the ultimatum uh, that they delivered. In other words, they want to roll back the clock uh, to a time when decisions were made when Russia was weak, Russia is now powerful. Those decisions wouldn't be made now. So why don't we go back uh, and undo those, undo those decisions? Uh, because those decisions about the expansion of NATO and the deployment of, uh, of American forces, particularly in the areas of the former Soviet bloc uh, and even uh, the former Soviet Union, uh, those are things that we consider to be threatening. Um, so there's that broader political set of goals, but I think those are not intensely held. I actually genuinely think that this conflict is about Ukraine uh, and that uh, tackling that broader agenda is, is part of the long-term uh, Russian goal, uh, but more the more narrow and more intensely held political goal uh, is to ensure that Ukraine is governed either by a Russian friendly or at least a neutral government, uh, and that Ukraine has zero military integration uh, with NATO uh, or on a bilateral basis with NATO members. In other words, it's not strictly about NATO. Russia has typically seen NATO as essentially the, the glove in which the American hand fits. Uh, and US military presence or British military presence or Canadian military presence or even Turkish military presence on Ukrainian soil is something that truly is a red line for them. Uh, so, how can that political goal be achieved, right? This is not the first time that this issue has come up uh, and it's proven to be very difficult uh, for the Russians to achieve this political goal. Uh, diplomatic conversations with the United States have proven to be a complete non-starter. Uh, the United States continually reiterates a core set of principles that the United States applies to Europe uh, about sovereign countries making sovereign choices, about an institutional framework, about a Europe whole and free, and Russia doesn't really, uh, Russia is not terribly interested in that. Uh, let's just say that's not going to achieve a Ukraine that is uh, whole and free of Western influence, uh, which is more their articulation of, of what they'd like to happen. So one alternative, which has been tried already, was after Yanukovych was ousted from power uh, in 2014. Uh, they tried limited military intervention uh, and, a, and a limited partition of Ukraine. Uh, and certainly with respect to the Donbass, kind of a temporary, it's at least conceived of as a temporary partition of Ukraine. And the goal here was to secure constitutional changes uh, so that Ukraine would be decentralized and more pro-Russian regions would essentially have a veto uh, over Ukraine's foreign policy and bloc membership. And they felt that that was a framework that would ensure Ukrainian neutrality, right? Uh, that if if Donetsk uh, is uh, able to veto um, NATO membership, NATO membership is never going to happen. 
Uh, that has failed, that strategy. Uh, the Donbass war was very successful for them. Uh, uh, and everything since 2014 was highly successful. Uh, they co-opted the Ukrainian Navy. Uh, they more or less eliminated the Ukrainian Air Force. Uh, and in uh, ground operations, they delivered some punishing defeats to the Ukrainian military that led to Minsk I and Minsk II. But it's failed successful militarily, but a failure diplomatically because Kiev wouldn't implement. Uh, even after a change in the elected government, so there was some hope, I think, that, that Zelensky, who ran on a, on a peace platform, uh, would, would move forward with the, uh, with the uh, Minsk negotiations and try to achieve a constitutional change in keeping with Minsk. But that hasn't happened. Uh, and Washington has increased its military integration uh, with Ukraine. Incrementally at first, uh, but accelerating more uh, in the last few years. And not just Washington, the Canadians, the Brits, uh, Turkish uh, supply of drones, which were demonstrated to be very effective in, uh, in the Karabakh war. There's a lot for Russia to be concerned about. Uh, moreover, uh, the, not only did the Zelensky government not kind of accommodate Russian interests within Ukrainian structures, it proceeded to sort of repress uh, pro-Russian elites. Uh, Viktor Medvedchuk is arrested and in under you know, he's under house arrest, uh, being tried on treason charges. Pro-Russian television stations were shut down. So there's this whole, and, and the, the data that Oya presented uh, about um, public opinion, right? Everything is trending away. Uh, from the desired political outcome here. And so the demonstrated use of force uh, and the demonstration of Russian power didn't produce the diplomatic result uh, that they had hoped for, which is probably why beginning in April, we have seen the development of a different type of use of force. Uh, and so they've been building up considerably, uh, and I'm not a military expert. Uh, I rely on others uh, to talk about uh, uh, the advantages of the Russian military deployments, but they seem to be very substantial and they seem to indicate uh, a willingness to take further military action to now impose a settlement. So if you can't get the Ukrainian government to impose it, you can't get Washington to pressure the Ukrainian government to impose it. Uh, it seems to be the case now that the Russian view is we have to impose it ourselves. Uh, and that means a war of regime change, uh, uh, in Ukraine, and that's a pretty tricky proposition. Uh, but I do think that that's where we are, we are headed. There was some thought at the beginning uh, that uh, a strategy of what's called by the Israelis mowing the lawn might work. In other words, you degrade the military capability. So maybe attacking all the special operations bases in Ukraine, everything that's highly integrated with NATO. Uh, it's increasingly the case that the lawn grows way too fast. <laughs> and so particularly in the last month, uh, the lawn is growing really quickly and there, we're pushing weapons into Ukraine now and pushing greater integration with NATO hardware uh, that the Russians probably are gonna have to say, you know, this is, this is not gonna work. In other words, we can't just move uh, and elicit a Western response that increases the vulnerability that we're trying to, to address. The problem, however, is that occupation is hard. Right. Uh, the U.S. doesn't have great experiences with regime change. And every time Russia has intervened uh, in the last decade, it has been with considerable local support, uh, whether that was Crimea uh, or the Donbass or Syria uh, or Kazakhstan. Right. Uh, they're always intervening and somebody else is doing the police. They're very good at the fighting side. They're not really addressing the occupation side. Now they do have a 300,000 strong National Guard uh, that might be useful in this regard, uh, but it's still a risk. Uh, it's still a risk for them. However, I think partly why I think this is gonna happen is that uh, I think that's a risk that they're willing to take in part because they're overly optimistic about what military force can achieve in Ukraine. And the US and the Western side is over optimistic about what military force won't be able to achieve in Ukraine. In other words, we tend to delude ourselves with the belief uh, that Ukraine is united against Russian aggression. 
uh, and that that is a fixed and stable state of affairs and it's only going to increase, right? On the other hand, right, uh, you know, I would say that Ukraine is probably about as united in its response to the threat of Russia as, you know, the U.S. is in its response to the threat of COVID. In other words, people have very different ideas how to respond to this threat. If you look at the way the Ukrainian population has responded uh, to invasion, uh, uh, starting with World War II uh, and moving up subsequently, there's been a quite varied response. In other words, we're likely to see as much collaboration uh, as we are resistance uh, in the Ukrainian case. And we kind of have a sense of the regions where that collaboration is most likely. And the Russians do too. Uh, and in general, their view is that uh, populations uh, are not as much of an impediment uh, as we think they are. Uh, so uh, no one would have thought that Chechnya would be governable uh, and that the governor of Chechnya would be advocating the military invasion of Ukraine right, uh, if we went back 20 years. Their belief is essentially that power itself uh, can change the views uh, of populations on the ground, and essentially they're likely to be successful. Uh, that Ukraine is a bit like Afghanistan in their minds, that once the US pulls back its support, it's gonna collapse like a house of cards and everybody's going to defect. Uh, so I do think that our optimism uh, that we can uh, deter Russia from intervention uh, through the supply of weapons and through the resilience of Ukrainian resistance. And Russian optimism uh, and the belief that uh, um, control is not going to be terribly difficult uh, of an area that uh, was united with Russia for 300 years prior to 1991, uh, that this is likely to, uh, to lead to a collision in this case. I don't really want to project how it's going to go, uh, but I wish it could have been avoided. Uh, and perhaps one way to have avoided it would have been to actually take into account Russian military power in these negotiations. Uh, it's something the US is very reluctant to do, but we might have to start doing that more going forward if we want to avoid uh, armed conflict of this type. Keith, thanks so much. And just before I get to our final speaker, just a uh, housekeeping note, if you have a question, please use the Q&A tab. Don't use the raise hand features. We're not going to go and call on people. We will translate your question and pose it to the speakers um, after our final speaker. Um, so our final speaker is uh, Olena Lenin, who is uh, new to our forum. So welcome, Olena. She's an adjunct professor of political science and national security at the University of New Haven, um, a Fulbrighter in Ukraine. And also she is the co-editor of an online forum, Eyes on Donbass, Politics, Places, and People at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. And her research is on questions of political legitimacy and the domestic foreign policy of Ukraine. And her commentaries have appeared in a number of publications, including Foreign Affairs and the National Interest. Uh, Elena, welcome, and um, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Alex. Um, just a little correction there. Fulbrighter from Ukraine, not Ukraine, <laughs> was transplanted um, to the US on a Fulbright scholarship. Um, but thank you so much for including me in this conversation. Um, as you said, I recently wrote a piece uh, for Poners reflecting on the lessons of the second Nagorno-Karabakh war and, and something that Keith um, also referred to, uh, and specifically how much analysis was focused on the decisive use of Turkish-made drones in Azerbaijan's eventual victory. Um, and many Ukraine watchers also uh, seem to have extrapolated from Azerbaijan's success a need for Ukraine to enhance its military capabilities, especially drone technology, to have a better chance of countering Russian aggression. Um, and many analysts have already written about um, how the role of drones and, and uh, kind of military technology has been exaggerated uh, in the decisive victory of Azerbaijan. If anything, it confirmed a long-standing axiom that, of the decisive effect of air power against uh, ground forces with uh, poor air defenses. So um, Azerbaijan's use of combat UAVs, uh, without a doubt, offered uh, valuable tactical lessons to Ukraine. However, in my piece uh, for Poners, I, I argue that Armenia, in fact, offers much more valuable insights for Ukraine on strategic and political levels. Uh, uh, in, in, in particular, two things I think are instructive to, uh, to Ukraine, Russia, and, and the West uh, 
um, uh, from uh, the Nagorno Karabakh experience is war optimism and groupthink, uh, or political consensus um, that could be uh, quite catastrophic. Um, so before I get into um, sort of uh, those two components, I want to make a disclaimer that in no way do I think that comparing those two conflicts is appropriate. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, all analogies are flawed and uh, will lead to misguided recommendations. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that the Nagorno-Karabakh War is a case study and a reference point from which we can draw variables uh, to measure that might have been overlooked in the Ukraine analysis, not necessarily to compare the, the, the two conflicts. So the, the two variables that I want to focus on is war optimism, kind of echo something that uh, Keith said too, uh, and groupthink. And, and both Zelensky... Uh, uh, Putin and uh, Western leaders, I, I think, have engaged in, in war optimism in their own ways, uh, and uh, collectively it can be catastrophic for everybody. I want to start with uh, uh, Vladimir Putin's war optimism and, and the sources of some of some of his miscalculations. Obviously, uh, the, the, the brunt of Putin's war optimism comes from military power um, that uh, by far outweighs uh, Ukraine's capabilities, obviously, despite Ukraine's improved combat readiness and capabilities um, as a result of the last seven years. Um, and it's quite clear that the Russians accurately assess that limited military campaigns in 2014 and 2015 have failed to extract concessions from Kiev and uh, deliver uh, political objectives that the Kremlin has been trying to, to uh, pursue. So the Kremlin sees a, a need to dial things up militarily um, because you new know, waiting will only uh, cost more for Russia as they perceive Ukraine. Um, you know, in the meantime, we'll only be gaining more support. Russian influence in the country will only be declining. Sanctions will only be rising. Uh, therefore, the time might be now. So it is looking increasingly likely that um, the Russians will be pursuing a, a regime change in Kiev. There are many indicators in place that, uh, that that's exactly where the Kremlin is headed with all of this escalation. The military choices and you know tactical choices are still contingent in my opinion, but the overall objective uh, of regime change has crystallized in the past few months, uh, and it's just a matter of, of, of how it's going to be executed. Now, Ukraine's cooperation with NATO poses less of a military threat to Russia and more of a geopolitical and geocultural threat um, as you know, Ukraine's European aspirations are perceived by Russia to be uh, to lead to political and ideological transformation in all spheres of life, not just in, in military cooperation that is not uh, compatible with, with the Russian uh, point of view. So uh, what is, obviously it's not lost on the Russians that there will be a strong resistance movement this time. If there's one thing that Putin should have learned from the past seven years is that he cannot rely on the locals to fight his war for him, on Ukrainian locals to fight his wars for him. Uh, if it was hard to mobilize locals in Kharkiv and Odessa in 2014-2015, it's certainly going to be almost impossible now. Um, if you um, look at some of the statistics, uh, con uh, some of the polls conducted in uh, December of last year when you know, uh, escalation reached its peak, um, uh, Kiev International Institute of Sociology uh, ran a poll where they asked Ukrainians how they were, they were going to be responding in case of a Russian armed intervention. Uh, nationwide, um, the number of people who said that they will they will put up armed resistance, they were ready to to, um, uh, to pick up arms and fight, it was uh, more than 50 percent, 50.2 percent, um, which is uh, kind of uh, to to uh, related to what Olya said. Uh, so we're talking about armed resistance, not just willingness to protest, which is still there, um, but actually um, you know fight. Uh, there are some regional differences, and that's really interesting because um, uh, the number of people who said that they're willing to uh, actually join resist armed resistance movements in the West is 60%, and in the East, it's less than 40%, 37%. What's interesting here is that willingness to fight is much higher in Western parts of the country where violence has not been concentrated so far and is not likely to be concentrated in the future. Um, and, and that's an interesting sort of statistics, statistic in terms of how ideology obviously uh, plays a role. So what, what I think where uh, Putin is miscalculated, miscalculating right now is the amount of irreversible change that the Ukrainian society has undergone. Um, and I do recognize that the Ukrainian society is not a monolith, um, but uh, the sense of national identity and loyalty has intensified. 
Um, and where uh, Putin seems to be miscalculating is the belief that uh, most changes in Ukraine had been brought from the outside, that, that the changes that Ukraine had undergone are a result of the West's influence and that Ukrainians themselves have very little agency in that process. And they, they suffered from this regime change that installed the tyranny of the national, nationalist minority uh, and the majority of Ukrainians will still sort of subscribe, are, are still redeemable in Putin's eyes. Um, in fact, I think many people in the West uh, overestimate Western influence. Um, it is true that you know, the, the uh, financial support of Western organizations had played a role in the rise of civil society in Ukraine, but it would be inaccurate to assume that U Ukrainian European aspirations had been imposed from the outside. The buy-in uh, is much uh, more genuine than, uh, than um, meets the eye. And I think that's kind of where uh, Putin may be miscalculating. Um, so now I'm going to speak a little brief, I know, uh, in the interest of time about Zelensky's war optimism um, and, and where he's coming from in terms of his miscalculations. Um, uh, obviously, rhetorically, Zelensky's war optimist currently and his kind of no panic response to the escalation is uh, mainly rooted, rooted in Ukraine's improved combat capabilities and uh, battle-hardened uh, military force. Um, obviously, there's still gaps in air, Ukraine's air defense and electronic warfare capabilities that Russia will exploit, but it's not going to be as swift, and, and Zelensky recognizes that. Uh, Ukraine also currently is enjoying some you know, military aid or assistance coming from 13 countries. Um, uh, so in addition to the U.S. and the U.K., obviously, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, a number of other countries have uh, pledged support in one way or the other. Uh, so we're up to about 13 now, uh, including Poland, Denmark, uh, the Netherlands, that have also pledged assistance. So Zelensky is also counting, I think, overestimating international support, because in the end, correlation of forces and, mil and mil military capabilities are not going to be decisive here. Uh, what I think contributes more to um, uh, Zelensky's war optimism and, um, and the current divergence in threat perception between the Biden administration and Zelensky comes from uh, leadership deficiencies uh, that uh, are trademark, uh, kind of straight talk um, coming from the entertainment industry. Um, I think that Zelensky's problem solving instincts um, and his um, and his responses have been cultivated in the entertainment industry. And so there is an uh, uh, there is an emphasis on theatrics and manipulating narratives, uh, sometimes at the expense of being transparent and telling people the truth. Uh, so I, I think that that's also where he might be miscalculating and, and um, perhaps leading to some tragic consequences. Um, again, in, in the interest of time, I think um, what, what we have seen from the analogy with Armenia too, in um, sort of overemphasizing international assistance and underestimating um, uh, the, the political will of the opponent uh, are all in play in Ukraine as well. Um, but I think even on the domestic side, uh, Zelensky's government may, may be miscalculate, miscalculating in um, monopolizing power and uh, pursuing political consensus, um, which again was also characteristic of Armenian government, um, in, um, in using extrajudicial measures in sort of imposing political consensus uh, in ways that perhaps could lead to uh, politicized decision making um, and could become a slippery slope in, in the future in, in sort of overlooking the diversity of opinion uh, in Ukraine. And I'm not just talking about um, the closure of, of Viktor Medvedchuk's channels that is sort of one of the high level uh, or high profile cases of sanctioning uh, opposition media, but there had been a number of other um, instances with the National Security Defense Council being empowered to almost perform the role of a judiciary and imposing sanctions that um, um, you know, is, uh, could be problematic, uh, not only because of their extrajudicial um, nature, but because um, evidentiary standards required for imposition of sanctions are much lower than would be required to launch a criminal investigation. Uh, so sanctions are imposed without due process um, and that potentially is a violation of, uh, of, of um, constitutional rights in Ukraine. So just again, to wrap it up, um, I know we're out of time. Um, you know, I, I think the, the experience of Armenia uh, in the second Nagorno-Karabakh war should be instructive, not just for Ukrainian leaders, but also for uh, Russian and Western leaders who should be uh, um, 
wary of uh, war optimism and pursuit of political consensus and disregarding sort of diversity of opinions. Um, and, 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 and all leaders across the board should stick to relentless diplomacy. Um, and uh, as, as uh, Secretary Blinken um, emphasized and focus on confidence and cooperation building measures if the goal is to prevent war. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Olena. Thank you to all of our speakers for really, really uh, uh, insightful comments. There's so much on the table here. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to apologize. Apparently, our transcription is uh, not working particularly well. I, uh, there are many reasons why this may be the case. But for people who are hearing impaired and were relying on the transcription when we started it, we're very sorry about this. To our speakers, just to be aware of this, if, if there's been a request, if you can slow down speaking just a little bit, for those of you who speak quickly, that may make it easier for people who are incredibly interested in everything that you have to say. Um, there's lots of questions. We have about 20 plus minutes at this point in time. I want to kick off myself with just one question, which is that so far we've heard a tremendous amount about Russia's security interests. Um, and we have heard about Ukrainian uh, domestic politics considerations, as well as some Ukrainian security considerations here. What we haven't heard about is anything having to do with Russian domestic politics. And so the question that I just want to pose before we move on is, again, on this question, why now? Why in late 2021, early 2022, are we seeing this activity as opposed to three years earlier or three years later? Is there a Russian domestic politics part of this that we've missed in our discussion so far that's important? Or does this have nothing to do with Russian domestic politics? So I'd throw this out to anyone who's interested uh, among the panelists to answer. Well, I have a, a partial answer. It's not entirely an answer, but I, I think this is uh, in part related to the thinking of, of um, one person in Russia, which is Vladimir Putin. The reason I say that is it's clear that Putin cares a great deal about the history of the collapse of the Soviet Union. As, as everyone knows, he's referred to it as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And if you think about that, there's a lot of competition for that title. And that's his number one pick. So the fact that the 30th anniversary of that event, which not coincidentally was the 30th anniversary of Ukraine becoming independent, another, another historical event he cares a lot about, the fact that those things happened just at the end of uh, uh, 2021, I, I think we're, we're, we're not unrelated to this ramp up now. I think he wanted to in some way mark this anniversary with a, a show of force, and that's in part for domestic consumption. We know, of course, that on the 25th anniversary of Soviet collapse 2016, Russia was engaged in hacking the US election. And there's also been a series of worrying coincidences between uh, the uh, event of Putin's birthday and events that could be seen as presents to him. Most famously, of course, the assassination of the human rights activist and journalist Anna Polakovskaya on October 7th, 2006, which is Putin's birthday. Similarly, the John Podesta emails were dropped on October 7th, 2016, Putin's birthday. Uh, there was a key uh, uh, battle in Chechnya, which was largely at Putin's motivation on October 7th, 1999. So in other words, you have someone here, he's not gonna say this in public, I don't think, but if you just look at the evidence, he likes to mark birthdays and anniversaries. And so I think at least part of the answer of why now is frankly that the 30th anniversary of the Soviet Union rolled around. Thanks, Mary. I hadn't, I had not heard, or I hadn't thought of that connection before. Keith? Yeah, I mean, I think there is a, you know, Putin has a, quite a bit of control over the Russian uh, domestic polity, and so he doesn't have to worry about uh, uprisings, but he does have to worry about popular support. And I, I think that may shape the nature of the conflict. So I think there's not a lot of Russian popular appetite for killing Ukrainians. So I, th I think that's going to create some difficulties. Like if he leveled Kharkiv, for example, this would be extremely unpopular. And kind of, you know, we've heard that the 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 units are getting Putin's uh, article from this past summer about you know Russians and Ukrainians as one people. That's that's kind of an interesting uh, piece of propaganda to give out to your units. It's you know this is not you know um, anti-Ukrainian literature in that sense. So it's so I think. They do have to be careful about what they do. I think that means they're actually likely to target uh, some areas where we think they're less likely to target, like the West. 
uh, where there are all the Ukrainian special operations uh, units that are based and things like that. So I, I do think that there, there is a constraint uh, for Putin, not that they couldn't do it militarily, uh, but it would kind of undermine their, their reasons for fighting if they ended up making it very bloody for the Ukrainian people. Uh, Max, did you want to speak to the Russian public opinion? Yeah, really quickly. Uh, I shared uh, a link to a very good article by Denis Volkov, head of the Levada Center, uh, with the latest polls of the Levada of how the Russians feel towards, uh, you know, the, the, the whole situation. And for now, the stats, uh, you know, up to 50% Russians rule out the possibility of any war between Russia and Ukraine. 15% uh, think it's just absolutely not going to happen. And about 39% say it's either inevitable or, or highly likely. But of all the, 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 the surveyed, uh, the 50% blame it, the, the start of the crisis on the U.S., and about 15% blame on Ukraine, and about only 5% blame it on Russia itself. So for now, I think the public uh, opinion is so far has been rather in, in Putin's favor. But uh, I personally think this whole situation uh, is not driven by any Russian domestics and, and rather perhaps uh, is more in, uh, oriented towards Putin's vision towards American domestics and where a U U.S. foreign policy priorities lie. Uh, something I, I discussed in my, in my piece on the, on the War on the Rocks, uh, especially relating to China. All right, we've got a lot of great questions in the Q&A. Uh, I want to start with a couple that are sort of around a theme of, is there a way out, a way the needle can be thread that involves everyone being able to sort of back off with, you know, but maintaining face around the issue of Ukraine and NATO? So one suggestion has been that Zelensky could come out and publicly declare neutrality, a la Switzerland or Austria or something along those lines. Another suggestion could be an agreement that the Ukrainian application to NATO would be, you know, maintained officially, but was not going to be considered for 20 years or something along those lines. Are these things still on the table? Or as I think Keith has kind of suggested, has this progressed much farther beyond just the question of whether or not Ukraine joins NATO to the point where these are not going to solve uh, the issue, or, and it, or or are we missing something else? Is there some other, you know, thread, or do we have to look much larger than this question of Ukraine and NATO to figure out how to solve this? Oh, bye. Uh, Keith, you want to take a shot? Yeah. yeah. I think it's, it's possible that an implementation of Minsk in the way that the Russians want Minsk implemented could end it, but we have made it very clear that is the U.S., uh, that we are not expecting the Ukrainian government to do that. So uh, I, I think that uh, they they may end up doing it, uh, but I think they're more likely to take the risk uh, that a Russian invasion is going to go poorly uh, than they are to, to implement Minsk. And I'm not sure that a capitulation uh, of a Zelensky government uh, would last very long. I think it might be overthrown. Um. Uh, Oleana, yeah, on the same point. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's beyond NATO, you know, um, and, you know, Ukraine uh, did have a set non-block status until 2014 when they revoked it and, you know, kind of overturned that decision, obviously. And then in 2017, uh, NATO membership became uh, written into international security strategy. But if you look at, 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 at polling data, it's interesting that uh, Ukrainians, uh, when they ask question of support of NATO and the EU, not only is there a high uh, degree of correlation between uh, NATO and the EU membership support, but also uh, the question itself, do you think of NATO and the EU being parallel processes? A lot of Ukrainians, the majority of Ukrainians say yes to that. So it's not only, I think in, in both in the Ukrainian view and in, in Putin's view, NATO and the EU um, uh, integration are perceived as so this uh, pro-Western right integration with Western institutions. And, and like I said in my presentation, it's less of a military threat and more of a sort of geopolitical, geocultural threat. Um, but I, I, I don't necessarily think that a non-bloc status um, right now would necessarily solve the problem. If you look at the trajectory of Minsk I and Minsk II agreement, Minsk I was signed uh, on the heels of the Ilovaisk, you know, as Ilovaisk battle, one the first most sort of lethal battle 
was unfolding and it created an off-ramp for Minsk one. Minsk two was tied to the Baltsevo uh, battle, another uh, sort of a, you know forceful um, uh, when when Poroshenko was kind of forced to the negotiating table. And what I, what I think is more likely to happen is that we're gonna we're gonna see a Minsk three, which much more maximalist demands and which much more lethal battles uh, linked to it. Olga, can I ask you to follow up on the on the, on this question from a public opinion standpoint of, and maybe engage with Keith's point about, has it is is the idea that Ukraine could declare neutrality at this point is that off the table now precisely because of these public opinion shifts that you've shown us, uh, and particularly in the western part of the country, but throughout the whole country. And then similarly, I want to ask you if you could also address Michael Anderson's question a little bit, which has to do with about. Um, and maybe this goes a little bit beyond public opinion data, if not, no worries. Uh, but to ask about this question of the extent to which we've talked a little bit about, um, Elena in particular talked a little bit about is Zelensky overestimating, Keith mentioned this too, Zelensky overestimating the amount of resistance that can be put up against Russians. I'd like to hear your take a little bit too on, do you, do you have any sense from the kind of research you've been doing about the extent to which you think Ukrainians would be likely to offer longer term resistance in the face of occupation at this particular point in time. So first part about, you know, they're two sort of related. Is neutrality off the table? Is that something that we should still be talking about as, as a way out of this uh, based on shifts in Russian and pu Ukrainian public opinion? And how does the Ukrainian public feel about the possibility of, of, of offering longer term resistance to occupation? Thanks, Josh. Those, those are very difficult questions to answer, and we're not in the business of futurology when we pull as so best of the, the opinion data I have at my disposal. First of all, uh, the issue around being a neutral state, um, it, it's no, I mean, some of our colleagues argue that it would be the most popular choice. Our data certainly do not show that. Um, so so the, we can and I can only stand by my data, which is, by the way, somebody asked a uh, nationally representative uh, samples of the Ukrainian uh, over 18 population. And we we have surveyed the whole Ukrainian territory uh, since 2014 repeatedly, uh, not including the Crimean uh, Peninsula. Um, and if people have more questions on that, then I can answer more. Uh, but let me answer this. Anything is possible with a different government in place. Right. So if a different party comes into power through whatever means, uh, inclusive of potentially uh, a Russian stage coup, um, then I would not be surprised if the, that that would be a policy that that uh, there are politicians in parliament that would support that policy of Ukrainian neutrality as a Lansky government, as it stands, would just be such a odd uh, turnaround that it would just, it would take, first of all, it would take all of his supporters by, by surprise. He would lose support if, if he or his party do not intend to continue uh, in government or in parliament, then, then maybe. Um, but Zelensky, when he was campaigning, people often criticize Zelensky for not actually having a campaign, uh, platform. That's not true. He actually talked about things like NATO in his campaign. Uh, uh so, and certainly in his inauguration speech, and then so many, we were actually doing discourse analyses of, of Zelensky's speeches now, and he is, it would be hard for him to backtrack. So Zelensky, I would doubt that. Something would have had to, would have to happen uh, behind closed doors that we don't know about to, to, for that to happen, that to me is unimaginable. Um, I do not think Zelensky is uh, overestimating at all. Uh, the sentiment among the Ukrainian population and in, in terms of their willingness to resist. Um, pretty much all the surveys conducted in Ukraine show that even in the east and south of Ukraine, you have majorities uh, of people that are willing to defend the state in a variety of means, including pick up arms themselves. Um, and these rates of, of willingness are actually much higher than they were in the east and south back in 2014 also. Uh, so it's just a different territory. And I think more importantly, very few people know that Zelensky, you know, they make fun of that he was this comedian and he had these concerts that were traveling around the country. And that, that, that's not, that, that wasn't actually important. People think that that wasn't important and that was actually problematic during the campaign because he wasn't taking the campaign so seriously. Uh, that 
issue aside, his uh, his troop actually has covered so many regions, big and small cities and villages and towns and so on across Ukraine that they have a really good sense of the general population's pulse on a variety of issues. And they have continued to do this through a variety of means, through down through analytical means and sociologists and so on. They're very much attuned to that population, specifically, I think, in the East and South that for so long felt that they were overlooked. Have, I think those those uh, those voters still think that in Zelensky, they have someone that represents them. Uh, of course, there is a small portion of the population in those regions uh, that doesn't agree with that, but we're talking about a much smaller portion of the population. We're talking about 10%, and then back in 2014, this was much, much higher. Great. So next question, I wanna bundle a couple of questions and insights here. There's one long question, a very good one from anonymous attendee about um, the effects of the Bucharest summit in 2008, where uh, the announcement was made that um, Ukraine and Georgia would inevitably become part of NATO as part of a, a compromise situation there of not giving them a map. Mary, I'd like to know your um, just opinion a bit. You, you've talked about some of the other pivotal points, but you know, maybe what's your take on Bucharest and the role that it has played in getting to where we are now? <laughs> and then a follow-up question for you that I'd like some of the other panelists to address, uh, maybe Max, uh, maybe Keith, um, uh, which is the question of be a credible commitments. We've seen time and time again that whatever the promises are or aren't, um, credibility is a real problem here. And Alexander uh, Brakel asks, um, provide US NATO are ready to accept Putin's demand, how likely would it be for Putin to honor such an agreement or for us to be able to uh, actually accept um, sort of a commitment here? Like why would this be the deal to end all deals in terms of, of, of grand bargains? So maybe you could think of it a little bit about that, but, but Mary certainly we'd love to hear your take on 2008 and what, what toll it has taken. Sure. Well, as a historian, I always go back to the past to understand the present and context. So let me just make one of the main points that I make in my book, Not One Inch. I think for too long, the debate over NATO enlargement has been binary. So either you think it was great or you think it was terrible. And depending on which camp you're in, you're, you're pretty entrenched in that position and then both camps yell at each other. And I'm trying with my book to add nuance and move the debate beyond this binary because NATO enlargement was not one thing. There were multiple ways debated at the time to enlarge NATO. For example, to cite just one of many variants that I discuss in Not One Inch, the British at one point took a very strong stance in favor of one and only one round of post-Cold War NATO expansion. In other words, they tried to convince the Americans to take their time pick a good selection of, you know, good from the British point of view, selection of, of countries, let them in and be done with it. So in other words, not have an open door. And the Americans felt strongly that there had to be an open door. So they made clear to the British that the British view was exactly wrong, that the uh, NATO expansion had to take a very small number of countries at first to make clear that it would keep going. Because if NATO took a lot of countries uh, in the early 90s, it might seem like it was done. There was even an acronym internally. The acronym was SIBROD. S-I-B-R-O-D. That stood for small is beautiful, robust open door, meaning let's make clear that NATO expansion is not going to be an event. It's going to be a process and it's going to keep going. Now, that didn't have to be the outcome of the debate over NATO enlargement. As I said, and I describe in Not One Inch, there were a lot of other visions for how to enlarge NATO, but that was the result. Okay, so now fast forward to 2008. You have set up NATO as this policy, this iterative policy with no obvious end. As I said, that's where my book title refers to the other sense of the meaning of not one inch. Not one inch needs to be off limits to NATO. So now you've gotten to the point where there's serious discussion about whether Ukraine or Georgia should be members. And in 2008, as, as many of your listeners will know, there was intense debate inside the um, NATO summit in Bucharest over whether that should happen or not. And the end result was, was meant to be a compromise. In other words, U Ukraine and Georgia, as many of your audience will know, Ukraine and Georgia did not get a map, which is a, a, a NATO term for actually getting onto the process of becoming a member. 
That did not happen. But in order to uh, keep the Americans under George W. Bush, who were pushing very hard for Georgia and Ukraine to become members, keep them happy, NATO allies agreed to a statement, a vague statement without any practical consequences, that Georgia and Ukraine will become members. And that's the heart of the problem now, because that was meant to actually be a weaker formulation. But then, of course, that uh, maximized friction with Moscow, which of course responded with the Georgia war of 2008. Much by the way, to the irritation of the Chinese, they did not appreciate it uh, that Putin's invasion of Georgia overshadowed the Olympics. Putin's invasion of Georgia started on August 1st, 2008, and the Beijing Summer Olympics started on August 8th, 2008, in the wake of that conflict. So I have a strong suspicion, this is based purely on my personal speculation, I have no evidence on this, but I have a strong suspicion that we will not see an invasion in Ukraine until after the start of this Beijing Olympics, because Putin does not want to steal the spotlight from Xi at a time when he's prioritizing Russian-Chinese relations. So that 2008 comment was a fateful comment and it's now one of the things that has fed into this, this controversy uh, that, that we have now, as many of the speakers have already noted. That's super helpful, thank you. Uh, Max, what's your uh, what's your view on uh, both Bucharest and sort of the credibility of any deal that comes over? And we are running short on time, so if you could be brief. very quickly, uh, I think the Bucharest uh, summit statement is incredibly important, and and I think was brought up on a number of occasions by Rapkov. Uh, what I think is somewhat missing in the Russian debate on this issue is that the Bucharest summit statement was in itself kind of a compromise deal between the George W. Bush administration and uh, the Germans and the French, who did not want Ukraine and Georgia and NATO at the time. And, you know, the Bush administration was pushing that. So that very uh, formulation that Ukraine and Georgia will one day become members of NATO was kind of an attempt to kick the can down the road and see what happens next. We're not shutting the door down, but it's just keeping it ajar. Uh, what, and, you know, the, what the, the Georgians and Ukrainians themselves took out from that situation uh, may be a different question. So this, I think, uh, created this kind of strategic uncertainty that Russia is talking about. So Saakashvili, perhaps, in Russia's view, uh, read that statement in his own way and thought that, you know, U.S. was going to jump to support him for his uh, military assault, and we ended up with the war. And I think there's ever since been this expectation in Moscow that whatever may come, uh, you know, happen in Ukraine, there might be this repetition of the Saakashvili syndrome, not necessarily come from Zelensky, but who, uh, some other parties and within uh, Ukrainian politics who would like to derail, you know, these talks between uh, US and NATO and stuff. So that's, uh, but it's interesting that there was, there was a somewhat adaptation of the Russian position on that stand after this first round of talks in Geneva, where Rapkov said that Russia would not necessarily you know demand even though it remains a priority this kind of uh, denouncing of, of that statement during the madrid summit of nato this june but would accept if us uh, would propose well of course uh, russians would like it in the written form but uh, the, this idea that the us should say we're not going to vote for ukrainian and georgian membership if NATO, if it's ever on the table so i think it's quite interesting but i would just end on one thing and say that Putin in this conflict does not act as a politician. Uh, he doesn't face any re-election. He doesn't face the issue of public support. So he does think of his role as more in kind of historical legacy terms here. Uh, 20 something years of his presidency was a constant pursuit of some grand deal with the West on different bases. You know, let's, let's see if Afghanistan is gonna happen after 9-11, let's see if Syria is gonna work and things like this. So I think this is perhaps maybe one of his last, of course, we don't know what's gonna happen after 2024, but perhaps it may be what he sees it as one of his last attempts to seriously renegotiate, you know, the terms uh, of, of the deal that Russia had to accept back in, uh, in the early 1990s. Super interesting, thank you. I think we are out of time, so I'm gonna have to, uh, end it there. And Keith, we'll have you back in the future as we'll have all of you back to, to give your comments. I know I promised you time, but, but we are out. Um, <laughs> I want to remind everyone who might be interested in the topic that we have another Columbia event on Friday, a joint saltzman Harriman event at noon. Um, what does Putin want involving Peter Clement, Kimberly Martin, Elise Giuliana, and then Stephen uh, Sostanovich. Uh, Josh, why don't you close it out for us and let us know about the next RPP?
Great, thanks so much. And I just, I threw in the chat as well, for those of you who have time this afternoon, there's University of Toronto Monk School has a, a great lineup of speakers by one of, uh, I, by involving lots of other, uh, on this exact same topic. So I put a link in there if people want at three o'clock today, you get more discussion from great uh, speakers as well. The next uh, uh, iteration of the New York City Russia Public Policy Series will be on February 21st. Again, at noon at this exact same time, we'll be looking at environmentalist movements in Russia. Uh, we're working on finalizing the lineup for that, but so far we're really excited about the people we have and we'll have people from both scholars who study this and practitioners who are on the ground uh, in various parts of Russia. And with that, I just wanna thank everybody for your time today. As Alex said, you know, we promised our speakers 90 minutes or they promised us 90 minutes, but this obviously this conversation could have gone on for another hour and a half easily. Thank you all for being here. Thanks once again to our speakers. Thanks to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for support. And uh, thank you. And we'll see you next time. So take care, everybody. Bye bye.